speed. We have readings by Gitanjali Shri and Bukhet Uzuner, and they will be introduced by Meeta Kapoor. This, is, this session is presented by the Embassy of Turkey. So without further ado, I pass it on to Meeta to start the session. Right till the end? No? Now? Is it better? Somebody at the back tell me if voice is clear. Good. Thank you. So a very warm welcome to all of you. Uh, we have with us today um, Bukhet from Turkey and Gitanjali from India, both of whom are very intense women writers and use very complex narratives to tell their stories. And sometimes these narratives are disjointed. So if you are their reader, you don't have the, com the comfort of being an armchair reader. You can't simply sink into the world that their books open up for you. You have to sit up, think, link up all the loops, pick up the threads, ask questions. What happens is it makes for very rich reading. You know, it's, it's uh, not very plush reading because you, you don't have a comfort zone. But uh, which is what I like because I like books to which move you, which rearrange your life, which make you uh, despair, make you feel all sorts of varying ranges of emotions, uh, which is exactly what happens with Bukit's uh, book, which I will introduce as, uh, which he just told me that it's called Istanbulu is what you're seeing as a paperback in our bookstore here. I am Istanbul in another country. Istanbulians and yet another and these are all English uh, versions of the book and we have um, Gitanjali's book which which I've just finished reading the room the room beneath their feet which is a translation from her Hindi book so between the two of them since I'm sure a lot of you wouldn't have been uh, wouldn't be too current with your reading I'm presuming because Bukhet is very new to us and Gitanjali has a very prolific list behind her I'm going to ask both of them to read short passages in the beginning and then we'll start talking to them about what they are reading. So I'm going to request Bukhet to give us a reading from her book first. Hello everybody, this is my first time in beautiful India and I hope next time when I'm here you will be, re you have already read my books and I'm totally unknown you now and I really wish to have a Hindu uh, translator and uh, Indian books published and I would like to see in your hands too. I'm reading a chapter which is called I am Istanbul. Istanbul as a feminine character is speaking there uh, as an uh, ancient uh, woman. I am Istanbul. City of cities, mistress of metropolities, Community of poets, seat of emperors, favorite of sultans, pearl of the world. My name is Istanbul and my subjects call themselves Istanbul. And of all the world's cities, I am without doubt the most significant, mysterious and the terrible. A city upon whose shores pagans, Christians, Jews and unbelievers, friends and foe alike, have found safe harbor through the ages and a place where love and betrayal, pleasure and pain live side by side. I, daughter of Poseidon, miracle of Argonauts, empress of medieval cities, the harbinger of the new age whose star shines anew in the 21st century, I am the city of prosperity and ruin, of defeat and glad, glad tidings. Istanbul is my name, it is I, place of extremes, the full gamut of human emotions experienced at one and the same time, from the sublime to the basest, the loftiest to the lowest, I. My name is Istanbul, eternal archangel and goddess of the cities. They come and go, leaving their mark on my soul I have seen them rise and fall, be born and decline. I harbor them, jumble relics in my underground cisterns and vaults. Blue as a hope, green as poison, rosy as dawn, I am Istanbul. I am in Judas tree, in Acacia, in Lavender. I am Turquoise. 
I am the unfathomable, the muse of possibility, vitality, creativity. My name is Istanbul. That's what they call me, what they have been calling me for a century past. But I have been Constantinople, city of Constantin. I began as Byzantium and have had many names since. The gate of heavenly felicity, Der Saadet, Derus Saadet, New Rome, Asitane, Daralie, Hepolis, Charidgrad, Stambul, Constantinia. Mortals are like that, forever changing names, laws, and borders. Ha, I laugh at those mortals taking themselves so seriously in their fleeting mortal world of false illusion, fears, and shadows. Had anyone thought to consult me, I would have chosen queen of all I survey, which I am anyway. I am queen of queens, city of cities. I have walked with emperors and sultans, shared the confidences of travelers and poets. Aspiring authors still line up to write about me. In, in fact, here becomes one now. The soul of even a great and noble city can feel the strain. Of late, I've been feeling restless, lest I harm myself and 15 million people who reside with me. I seek distraction. That's why I choose this day to turn my attention to Yeshilköy, my old green village, now my modern face, home to what they call Atatürk Airport. I am Istanbul, I am the only female on the earth who did not have menopause for 2,700 years. Thank you. That was very evocative. Thank you, Bukit. I'm going to ask Gitanjali to read in Hindi first and then a bit in English so that you get a sense of not just because she writes primarily in Hindi and then she's been translated. So to enjoy the richness of her writing, I think we should do that. And then I'll, we'll come back to talk to them. Uh, just very briefly, I want to tell you it's a novel about uh, uh, the friendship of two women, which um, um, takes place in flowers up on the roof. A roof which is uh, common to many houses. So while there is conservatism in the houses and maybe people are not allowed to meet you know, from this house to another one. Up on the roof, it's a, a space of freedom and um, their, their uh, friendship and many other things flower out there. So this is uh, the, a narrative of the, yeah, of uh, one woman is now dead and her friend is remembering her and uh, uh, that woman's son, is, uh, uh, no, that woman's nephew has complete contempt for the friend. So this, uh, she's having this uh, imaginary conversation with the nephew and that is what the narrative is. Remembering her friendship with his mother, aunt, sorry, <laughs> I'm completely confused <laughs> myself. So anyway, enjoy the cadence of the language, if nothing else. Main burka na lati. तो कब तुम्हारी चच्चो को लेबर्नम हाउस के बाहर किसी गंदे संदे बदबूदार लैट्रिन में गंगा जल बहाने का सुख मिलता तंग आ रही थी मैं उसकी डेली प्रश्नावली से फिर फिर क्या हुआ कब पता चला उसे वो डाकू का बेटा नहीं है सीन बाय सीन उसे पूरी कहानी बताओ गाना सुनाओ हीरोइन की टाइट कमीज का ब्योरा दो दर्जी से वैसी ही बनवाओ पहनो उसकी आंखों को ठंडक देने लेकिन ठंडक कहां बिटवा जलती थी तुम्हारी चच्चो की आंखें अरे मार जलंतु चिकोटियां काट काट के मेरी बाह सुझा देती कि तुम्हें क्या तुम तो अदृश्य हो कहीं भी जाओ मैं गई तो सब देखेंगे अदृश्य नहीं अदृश्य दिखलाई गई जब बहन जी कुछ नहीं कहती ना ओम बाबू को ना उनकी को तो लेबर्नम हाउस में किसकी मजाल कि वो कहें वो कहेंगे तो अब ये ललना को कहना नहीं होगा इन दो इज्जतदारों की छीछा लेदर करना होगा उनके साय में पकते कश्मीरी सेब को खाएं कैसे खा नहीं सकते तो देख देख के ललचाएं क्यों तो चुप ही बेहतर न देखना ही मतिमान आंख मुझ पर पड़ती तो यो कि कुछ भी नहीं सामने क्या कहूं उनकी उस नजर का मजा कीड़े मकोड़े डरा करें कि दिख गए तो मसल दिए जाएंगे हम तो शेर नहीं सा निकलते उन्हें करने दो फिक्र मेरे चंगुल की हम तो इठलाएंगे हम तो गाएंगे 
धुन चढ़े तो खचखच खुज खुज जाघे खुजाएंगे खुजाएंगे कमाल है खुजली हो तो क्यों ना खुजाऊं मरी जाऊं किस सम्मान को पाने के लिए जब हम दिख ही नहीं रहे तो हमारी खुजली क्यों दिखे चलो तुम्हें भी अदृश्य बना दें मेरा ही मस्तिष्क चमका एक बुरका ले आई जाकर मेरे संग निकलोगी ना न मैं दिखूंगी न मेरी साथिन खुशी से मान गई संगी साथिन कानों में छः फुटर बालियाँ लटकाई पाँव में चमक गमक हील की जूतियाँ चढ़ाई बदन पर टाइट कमीज चिपकाई बन ठन कर ऊपर बुरका सरका लेती लिबर्नम हाउस वाले अभी भी अमूमन सोने के पहले और तड़के जागने तक ही जीने से छत पर जाने और नीचे घर में आने के दरवाजे की कुंडी लगाते हैं दिन भर एक घर से दूसरे घर घर से छत छत से छत आवाजाही हो पाती है शायद छिप छिप के अभी भी लोग मिलते हैं शायद हों अभी भी ऐसी औरतें जो बच्चों को स्कूल कॉलेज भेज कर, पति को काम पर रवाना करके निकल आती हैं अपने घर से छत पर और उतर जाती हैं किसी और के घर के सुनसान दरवाजे से पीछे को निकल रिक्शा लेने नाहक छुपके लेबर्नम हाउस के बड़े फाटक से नहीं पीछे झाड़ियों को दबाकर लांग कर लांघना एक ऐसी क्रिया जिसमें खुशी की छलछलाहट है लांघो तो तन अलग दिल अलग फड़कता है लांघी जाती है दीवार झाड़ी छत दहलीज सीमा चंद्रमा लांघते ही छूटती है खिलखिल हंसी बुरके के अंदर से जो दबाए न दबे डरे जाए पर छिटके वो हंसी बिटवा तुम कभी नहीं हंसोगे वो हंसी हंसने के लिए बिटवा तुम्हें लड़की होना पड़ेगा लड़की जो हमेशा नंगी होती है इतनी नंगी कि उसे ढेरों कपड़े चढ़ाने पड़ते हैं परत पे परत परतों पे परते और वे सारी बुरके से ढुकनी पड़ती हैं वो नंगी लड़की जब हंसती है तब निकलती है वैसी प्यारी हंसी नंगी लड़की की हंसी तुम क्या समझोगे बिटवा um shall i is it time yeah yeah so well i am attached to my own but the translation is there for those who don't understand hindi if not for me and the burka i brought how would your chacho ever have stepped out of lebernum house and known the bliss of peeing in a dirty stinking latrine i'd had it up to here with her regular routine of questions then then what happened when did he find out that he wasn't the decoy's son with having to tell her the whole story scene by scene with having to sing her the songs describing the heroine's tight kameez getting it made from the tailor and then wearing it for her pleasure but where was pleasure in that bitwa your chacho's eyes would blaze she'd be so jealous that she'd pinch my arms until they were swollen saying what's it to you you are invisible you can go anywhere if i go everyone looks not invisible ignored when neither behan ji nor om babu said a thing who in labarnam house would have the courage to speak and if they did speak it wouldn't be just lalna they were maligning but these two respectable people as well how could they eat this kashmiri apple ripening in their midst and if they couldn't eat it what was the point of drooling over it so silence was better blindness was wise and even if their gaze did stray in my direction it was as if i wasn't there oh how i loved that gaze insects are afraid of being seen because they'll be squashed i on the other hand would step out like a lioness let them worry about my claws i will dance i will sing if i feel like it i will scratch my thighs why shouldn't i if they itch should i kill myself to get their respect when they can't even see me how will they see me scratching myself come let's make you invisible i had the idea i went and got her a burqa now you can come out with me i am invisible and any friend of mine is invisible too my friend nodded happily she dress up in a skin tight kameez with six inch danglers in her ears and her feet in shiny high heels then she throw the burqa on top even now 
the people of Laburnum House lock their doors only between night and early morning while they sleep. Coming and going from one house to another, from one roof to another, is possible all day. Perhaps even now people meet secretly. Perhaps there are still women who go to the roof after their children have gone to school and their husbands to work and descend into someone else's empty house to exit by the back door and catch a rickshaw for no reason, secretly, not from the big main gate of Laburnum House, but jumping over or pressing through the shrubbery out back. Jumping, an act bursting with joy. When you jump, your heart and body thrum and thrill. Walls are jumped over, hedges, roofs, thresholds, borders, the moon, and immediately a joyous laughter bursts out from under the burqa, a laughter that cannot be suppressed, even though you are afraid someone might hear. That's a laugh. You can never laugh, Bitwa. To laugh like that, you need to be a girl, a girl who is always naked, so naked that she has to wear heaps of clothes, layer on layer, and cover it all up with a burqa. Only when that naked girl laughs can you hear that beautiful sound. How can you understand the laughter of that naked girl, Bitwa? Thank you. So I'm going to thank you, Gitanjali. That and the, the reading in Hindi, and for most of us who understand here, and the translation in English, I think, uh, although the richness of Hindi doesn't come into the language, uh, when it's translated in English, but it was a very, very close translation. I think we'll have to credit your translator for that. Uh, Buket, I'd like to ask you. Well, he, he knows what's good for him, he should be here. <laughs> I, uh, Buket, turning back to you, I uh, thanks for sending the PDF of the book much before. So at least I enjoyed reading the book and I cherished every page. You portrayed Istanbul as a temptress a dream giver, a virago, a mother. Um, she's even very cruel and she plays many such extreme roles in your book. What is it that made you portray her so strongly as a woman? Because there's one line in which, uh, which stuck in my head when I was reading the book which said, she never lets you go. She makes you miss her like a lover. Mm -hmm. So what is it about Istanbul that you portrayed her as a woman? It's, uh, it's not because I am an Istanbulian, a real Istanbullu. I was born in Ankara, the capital city of uh, Turkey. But uh, there are several, very few cities in the world. I'm, I'm a great traveler and uh, uh, only half a year I live in Istanbul. The other half I am somewhere else and I love to uh, travel. And um, it's pity that this is my first time in India. It's a bit too late. but better than never. Um, so um, I figure out it's not only my uh, idea but also I read um, books about cities and cities are man-made places. I choose the word man not human because there are very few ancient cities by, uh, by women they were designated and um, uh, designed. So the cities are ma made by men all over the world and for the males um, needs and desires it, and, and I just want to ask the audiences and you yourself that if a city was only planned by m females in the world just think and imagine how differently it will have been. So Istanbul is also uh, of course like I, 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 uh, I renamed those kings and sultans who changed the names like the Constantinopolis um, by the king of Constantine and also the Fatih, the conqueror uh, Sultan Mehmed, uh, many others. But there are few cities in the world that you move there, you immigrate, whatever, you feel that your, uh, you find your soulmate there and you easily count yourself as one of those cities. New York is one of them. If anyone is from New York or moved to New York, uh, one can easily say, I'm New Yorker. I don't know about uh, India yet because it, it, it has been very short time for me. I only see Delhi and here uh, Jaipur. 
But there are certain cities in the world, like Paris is also like that. People move to Paris from different countries or the countryside of France. They are Parisian. And Istanbul is one of those very few cities in the world. You can move from somewhere else to Istanbul, then you can say, I am Istanbul, or Istanbulian. Uh, I think it's because of the, um, the, uh, the, the relation of that city with the different cultures that is very popular saying this multicultural cult, cult, uh, countries or cities. I think Istanbul has one of those bloods, but also it has a different um, um, geographically something special in Istanbul. It's the only city in the world that the sea is passes through. And there is another city in Turkey called Çanakkale, the Gallipoli. Gallipoli, maybe you know the, from history. It's also in the Bosphorus. But those people who, who live there, they feel very bad that when I say in Turkey in, uh, in the TV uh, interviews or the uh, papers that Istanbul is the only city the sea is passes through. Like, you know, um, uh, it's a geographical fact. They say that those people from Çanakkale, they get really uh, uh, abandoned and they send me emails, Miss Buket, no, we are, we have the sea, you know, but it's passing by, Çanakkale is different, even it's in the Bosphorus. So the many other things makes that city special to me and it's very few, like more than, not more than 10 cities in the world. You move there and you feel one of that. I think it's it's very feminine in that sense because water is very feminine in, in ge uh, geology and the ecology. When there is a water, life starts with water, even your Darwinian or uh, religious or uh, secular, whatever you are, the water means um, always the life, like feminine power. And the, um, um, it, it's, it's always ready to give a birth, even it's very, um, old and has many problems, urban problems, immigration and other cultural problems dealing with now. But still, many people are moving, they want to go to Istanbul. Like, you know, many people are moving to New York City or Paris, and I don't know, maybe Delhi is the same here. I don't want to talk because I don't know very much. So that many things makes Istanbul so um, uh, ready to give new births and uh, and special and I think that's um, if I put all these together uh, not only um, the geographical way but also cultural things that they, um, I, I had a piece of um, uh, travel writing which was called my ex-husband Paris my lover um, New York and my soulmate Istanbul so this was my triangle of the cities and a friend of mine, um, a Hungarian poet, wrote me a letter saying, I didn't know that Turkish was that feminine language. Actually, yes, it is. But on the other hand, if I was uh, choosing this, um, choosing that uh, title as my ex um, uh, suppose Paris, it would have been totally different. But it, the, the um, psychology and the consciousness of that a female writer, a woman writer is calling my ex-husband, my lover, and my soulmate. So this shows the, uh, the freedom of uh, the women who is choosing uh, the, the, the male cities as, as husbands and lovers for herself. That makes, I mean, it's because I am Istanbulian, I had this chance and, and power to choose that title. That's, that's a fascinating, uh, uh, I wish we had time to read uh, that passage of yours. Could you email that to me at least? I I'll read it. You are projecting the feminine power in your writing. You're also talking about the inherent healing wisdom of nature. Yes. You're also looking at um, of eco-literary criticism, which is one of your major concerns because you're involved with studying environmental science and ecology. Um, what is it? Because there is this concern throughout, even in fact the first few pages of your book, there is this dialogue between the two women who are traveling together and they, when they're reaching the airport, the older woman, I'm yes. forgetting her name, I'm sorry, is very concerned about what is happening to Istanbul. Yeah. Right? So maybe that's your way of voicing your concern about the disappearance of tangible, in an intangible yeah. heritage, mm -hmm. which is I think one concern that all of us, and I'm sure Gitanjali agrees, 
in India, we are constantly battling with what we are losing out on as our cultural heritage. So if you could say something about that before I move to Gitanjali with my questions for her. Okay. Um, um, I have a um, um, uh, very scientific background and usually in Turkey they think it's very um, tricky because they usually think that the people who study social sciences or literature must be a writer, you know. But um, in, in the world literature there are many engineers and scientists who are good, good writers at least as, as far as I know. So uh, I studied ecology, microbi microbiological ecology and um, um, uh, environmental sciences for a long time and I made my life for a very long time uh, by, uh, by studying and um, uh, making research on environmental sciences. And now um, I would like to jump to another subject and I try to put them together. Let's see if I can. Uh, I'm traveling uh, different countries for, the, um, uh, for these kind of uh, literary gatherings, uh, literary festivals or writers' um, ateliers um, and um, colonies. And uh, in the last 10 or 15 years, I always hear these very well-wished um, cliches. Now it's getting cliché that I put them together like cultural plural pluralism, globalization, immigration problems, modernity and tradition, the verses, the uh, together, multimedia, mass surveillance problems, women issues like honor killings, so-called, I don't know who is honor, is it? And then ecological problems related food and natural disasters and hate crime. We are, with, with the very good will, uh, many writers all over the world, when we get together, intellectuals, academicians, we are talking these things and now, we are talking too many times and repeating these things. It became like these words are losing their ways and um, um, uh, importance. But uh, now um, I, c I came to a point that we must say something new. Yes, we know that we have these problems. And uh, uh, this is where I put my uh, scientific background with literature together because I believe natural environment now we have to confess that um, confronts with the human society. So we used to put the science somewhere else and the social sciences. But we must, it's time now, we, we must put them all together because this boundary actually cuts this modernity. We, I think we all misunderstood that. And like you have a wonderful uh, scientist that I, I really wish to meet her, Vandana Shiva. Yeah. Her books are really great and I really wish to meet her with person because I'm reading her books for my new uh, nature quartet novels I'm writing. And also a Korean ecologist, Mr. Jo Cho Ja Chun. He is the ch chief of the um, Na National Ecology Center in Korea, and American writer Aldo Leopold, nature writer. These three are three people. They really put the, um, um, the, the highest level of understanding where and how we have to put these natural sciences together with human sciences. I think the epistemology and the um, uh, ontology now uh, it's ready to put them together so that's why we cannot uh, put the environmental things and considerations including human nature like women's issues animals issues those um, uh, create creatures living things who are not human they have to be considered as um, at the same statue of uh, human now we have to see that there is no other choice and uh, the, the the freedom of the earth and the, the solving those problems i mentioned actually they must uh, come together with the science and the literature must be hand in hand and i foresee in the future uh, will be uh, the literature will be full of such things and and i'm working very much about this shamanism the the, the turkish belief uh, before islam now in my new quartet i'm writing the water earth and the fire and the air the quartet novels i'm working on and uh, so i think what you're saying is very relevant because uh, we are in a world where we have to accept interdisciplinary 
cooperation between various fields. And in fact, right here at the festival yesterday, if you attended Marcus Satoy's uh, session, who spoke about the language of mathematics mm. with aesthetics, with symmetry, mm. with design, mm. with science, and it was one of the most revelatory sessions that mm. uh, one could um, uh, have attended here. But coming back to the interdependence between what you were saying, women's issues, and um, social sciences, as well as because if we need to save our environment, which is, which is a global concern right now, it is just not an Indian concern or a Turkish concern, it is a global concern because each one of our cultures is fast dissipating, which is one of the backlashes of globalism. Mm -hmm. But the whole concentration here for today's writing, I will turn back to uh, women's voices because we are the reproducers, we are the caregivers, and we've had centuries of certain suppressed heritage which we've inherited, which Gitanjali deals with in her writing. There is this common thread in all her books running throughout where the woman's voice is very strong. And I'm going to, because she read from both the Hindi and English uh, books. So the original title is Tirohit, which means hidden. And she, her, her writing, her narrative is a celebration of suggestion, of the power of suggestion, let me put it correctly. So can you tell us what is the layered hidden meanings that you've threaded into your story in the book, The Roof Beneath Their Feet, which is the English translation of the Rohit? Um. I, I, I don't uh, work with a neat formula ever, so I, I won't say that um, there's anything terribly deliberate about all this, but I can see certain patterns, certain directions uh, perhaps that um, interest me a lot more than others. And I, in the course of having to describe my way of writing and my kind of writing, I kind of hit upon this that I often I'm more interested in what's happening backstage. It's like where the real story is taking place, where the real plot is unfolding is not the um, place where I directly want to look. It's uh, where it is being remembered or where it is being prepared for. So it's often, you know, some other space which is um, putting, uh, shedding some angled light onto the main uh, plot. So in this, so that is why the hidden or the subtle or the suggestion invariably comes into my work, I think. But people who evaluate my work and critics should be able to probably tell it better than I can. In any case, in this work, um, what interested me was, it was just the, it was pretty much out of the blue but the motif of the roof in India, especially in uh, provincial India, in uh, the older traditional parts of India, where the roof is common or the houses are so closely clustered together that the roof is as if it were common. That uh, for me was a very inspiring space because uh, it permitted a life up there which could be a total sort of variance of the life under the um, roof. And it became a space of freedom, you know, the sky above and the roof beneath their feet. And that motive inspired me, that metaphor inspired me. And I began to uh, write about the play that is going on up there, about life that is going on up there. And a lot of women's lives ha do many things up there on the, ter you know, on the roof. Where the pickles are made and the clothes are being um, you know um, uh, hung out for drying and and romances are you know being conducted so all uh, many things which are not allowed are happening up there on the roof and that permits some other confidence and some other freedom and that got me going and i think as i wrote on it became the story of the friendship of two women of two different classes you know so under the roof they are not permitted this friendship but up on the roof it could flower and become an intimate friendship. Uh, 
what you've done with Chacho and Lalna are that they're two very different characters. Yeah. They're, they're distinct in their own personalities, but they're, they've come across as very strong. Mm -hmm. One is slightly more vociferous, while the other is doggedly strong. Mm -hmm. And then there is this romantic triangle, which you're talking about, but yet not overtly so. So why just the suggestion of romance? Why not go out and out and just, you know? Because what happens on the terrace, because your la the terrace of Labanam House is also, it's almost a character. I think it mm. speaks to me more than any other character in your book. It's alive, it's pulsating, it's, it's got this vibrant energy. So why this, is this a sort of a thing that evolved on its own also, or it was something that you wanted to do? Well, I think it pretty much evolved uh, on its own. But as for why it's not a um, story which goes out and out and talks about the romance between possibly the two women and so on is because I do not know out and out about their romance. So I think I'm, I'm, I'm just uh, somebody who's uh, managed to get some indications of an uh, intimate friendship. And I think what interested me was that People, de people look. Uh, people have a very stereotypical idea about everything, including romance. Mm. So for their and people have uh, people have very much what is often described as a male view of things. Mm. So uh, for the people of Laburnum House, um, there was a man in this house who was enjoying two women. Mm. And as a matter of fact, the man we discover as the story goes along is more and more redundant you know the man actually has practically no role to play and the women are deriving so much sustenance and friendship and purpose in life from each other but it's the friendship of women particularly I think in the perhaps I had the time of my mother's generation in mind I think a lot of women's friendships are pretty invisible yeah. you know nobody really talks about this, they're not sort of big statements as they are today. So I got interested in that and I followed these women around in a manner of speaking and got, you know, indications and ruminations of a great intimate friendship. Right. How much time do we have? Excuse me, hello? <laughs> Somebody? Time. We have? So about 10, more than 10 minutes? Okay, then I can ask each of you one, one more question mm -hmm. before we let it open to why we haven't started with the questions yet. Um, I'll come back to you, Buket. Just one last question. We are living in a day and age where even if you give me a pen to sign a book, I find it difficult to write. All of us are used to typing on our keypads and on our phones. Mm -hmm. Gitanjali here still writes in longhand, and I. I just wanted to know how does she manage to do so many pages, complete book after book in longhand? What makes you do it still? I was born a dinosaur and I continue being a dinosaur. <laughs> no, I think, well, um, I think when I started writing, um, typewriters were uh, in, but not the computer. And um, when I started, I was still um, not such a slow writer. But as I went on, I became a slower and slower writer, and I never speed never became something that I was looking for. So the pen worked very well for me. I liked the, the slow speed it permitted me. I liked, of course, I mean everyone talks of the material connection and the intimate connection and so on. Mm. It's habit also, mm. but there was no real reason, practical or inspirational, to break that habit. And since I'm anyway going to be thinking and imagining slowly and uh, working on it slowly, taking my time over it, mulling over it, um, taking a years to write one book. It's okay, I mean, the pen works fine. I've not really thought of switching. I don't think I'm going to do much better if I s switch to something speedy like the computer. Mm. And if I don't write a book a year, the world is spared, I'm sure. <laughs> I'm you're just being modest because my next question was going to be I want both of you to tell us what is your next work that's happening. I Are you about yeah. the same writing? You would, stuff. yeah. 
because I'm very famous in Turkey that I am writing my novels more than thousand pages each of them by handwriting. You're also writing by hand? And I love technology. I'm a scientist oh, by okay. education and my biggest problem in India with the, with the internet connection, <laughs> you know, if they ask me, if it's slow, then I get sick. So when I travel, I ask, you know, before the shower, if the hotel says shower or not, I ask if they have free Wi-Fi. Otherwise, when I go back home, I pay a fortune to Turk sell or this will be an advertisement, just forget it. So um, I love handwriting and if I was born in, during Ottoman Empire, I probably would be um, a calligraph Hunger. at the Sultan's <laughs> yeah. uh, uh, palace, but then <laughs> it's because I, I'm, I'm a woman, I would be a woman, I must, I'm very sure of that, I have a very feminine uh, inside, so uh, it wouldn't be uh, uh, easy for me to be a feminine calligraph for the Sultan, probably I would change my clothes and you know, and uh, secretly so I would be. a woman calligrapher? Well, I could have been then working for the women sultans, the queens. Okay, but the queens I wouldn't maybe. take that because the, the, the power was in the hands with of the, sultan. With the man. So yeah. I had to be writing for the, uh, the so you'd sultan. So you would imagine yourself being disguised? Of course. <laughs> <laughs> and I would have been again so writer, calligraph and traveler. Yeah, so I'm that's another sure. another thing about your your grappling with multiple identities. Isn't that one of the issues that you keep bringing up in your writing? Don't tell. Maybe there are some psychiatrists here because <laughs> some of no, the I'm psychiatrists. I'm not suggesting. <laughs> I'm not suggesting an identity disorder. Yeah, I know it was a joke. Because okay. because all of us in our contemporary lives, I think we are living as multiple people inside one person. Of course. So. I don't want, I don't think I'd like to disguise myself as a man. I think that'd be an insult. But writing is that important and calligraphy I love so much, you know, your, your, for example, alphabet is so tempting for me because of this alphabet so beautifully around and I'm just looking at that attractive, you know, the, the act of writing is so tempting for me. It's something else, you know, with the, I have the fountain pens and a nice notebooks and thousands and thousands pages. Then I go to the computer and it's really, that is a burden, you know, I have to, to take them. To transcribe, yes, yeah. I know, I know. So when you are writing, Gitanjali, what is it that makes you pick up the pen? I mean, do you do, you do pages together? Because it is a laborious act. I mean, considering that we've got used to that kind of speed, it is a laborious act. So are you writing your next book also in longhand? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I write it in longhand and like I said, I mean, I'm, I'm not a fast writer, so even if I had the computer, I think I would write one word and think for 10 hours. So it's, I write slowly and I write, uh, I don't know how many drafts, but uh, it, it can vary, but I work on the draft and there can be more than three or four drafts of each work and it takes months, okay. sometimes a few years. Mm. Right, but feminine voices remain your predominant. Uh... Well, I, I, I won't say um, that's a hard and fast rule or a deliberate uh, choice. Often, yes. I mean, I'm a woman. I have a certain sensitivity towards the woman. I hope <laughs> so. It comes in invariably, but I don't think that's really my barrier or that's that's where you know you you don't have to hem me in there that's what i do I and mean, i think uh, as a writer i would be very happy to break that barrier as well and you know imagine uh, a man's voice why not and i have written certain things which in that sense won't fit in the woman's the voice woman's category voice, yeah. yeah i have a major novel which is uh, on um, Hindus and Muslims in this country mm -hmm. and it's, just, it's very different from my other novels but it is about the two communities and what happens, uh, what's that, happened between that's them right, that's right. and I don't think the, I'm sure that there also there is the feminist voice and there is the um, uh, sensitivity to why just feminism? I think extend feminism to humanism. I think I, I would but like that to is, think that is it's exactly a where we need to come voice. To. Yeah, yes. but uh, that's not the deliberate. Uh, that's never the deliberate agenda in my writing. I think with that we'll open it out for questions. Are, are, are T Works people ready with the mics? 
any questions because you know I can't see with the light so I'll leave it to you people to just give the mic in a fair and free manner thank you Uh, hello, ma'am. My question is for Kitanjali, ma'am. Uh, ma'am, at one point you compare a woman to a lioness, while at another one you should, uh, say she is naked. So, do we expect such disparities between the lives of men and women and these problems in this book, uh, the translation of Tirohit, or even solutions would be uh, an option for the readers? I don't know quite what to make of your question, but um, tell me if I'm in any way addressing whatever you are saying. But uh, first of all, I'm not trying to give any solution, certainly not. And I don't uh, really see any contradiction there which does not work. The, the laugh the laughter of the naked girl and naked here is a metaphor okay so the la the laughter of the naked girl is the laughter of uh, um, you know in a society where woman is being told not to be loud to keep herself demure covered quiet etc etc this laughter is deep inside and something is now being done when the lang rahe wo kisi barrier ko then this laughter is coming from deep inside and it's got so much joy in it. So it's describing uh, such a genuine tinkling laughter, you know, and it's trying to capture that quality of freedom which comes uh, to somebody who is um, forced by propriety to be much more reserved. And uh, the lioness, um, um, you know, Mohavra, wo banta hai, wo dusri jagay banta hai, jahaan ye character, agar aap kitab padhenge, to aapko samaj mein aayega ki ye character to Sherini ki tarhe ghoomi rahi hai. She is, uh, she is not seen as a completely respectable woman. So the people of Laburnum House are not very happy that a respectable woman has made friends with this not so respectable woman. But because they respect Chacho, they keep quiet about their disrespect for this other woman and that gives her so much confidence that she walks around walks around like a lioness so actually it is i think reasonably well explained in the thing if you read it you will surely have no problem <laughs> yeah. my question is to Bukit. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, istanbul is a very cosmopolitan city and uh, I can't Could you be a little louder? Because uh, you, you have mentioned that uh, Istanbul is a very cosmopolitan city and uh, once you are in the city you feel that you can call yourself. Uh, we see that uh, uh, Turkey, the later sultans, they had a lot of influence of the European influence and uh, in the early part of the last century Can you repeat the last, last sentence? I yeah, the, the, the later the, the, I am talking about the influence of European culture on the Turkish sult sultans and also this, uh, I am talking about when Mustafa Kemal uh, discontinued the use of uh, the Arabic script in Turkish language. So now as your last note you were discussing, you are still writing. So you are still writing in Roman or you are writing in Arabic? Yes. yes. And has that uh, diluted the the whole concept of the Turkish identity and the Turkish uh, the uh, Turkish culture? That's a good question because, especially in Europe, they ask me, and they never ask me any question about Turkish literature. But this Turkish ident identity is the biggest problem all over the world. I learn how to re respond this. First of all, the Turkish, for, Turkish language was not written with Arabic alphabet before Islam. And Uyghur alphabet and Göktürk alphabet, before Islam, Turks were shaman, living mostly in South Siberia, and they were shamanic. And Turkish, in Turkish language, shaman is Indian word. We used to call ourselves Kaman. So there are hundreds and millions of Turks 
named by Kaman surnames and there are many cities small towns called Kaman so we still keep our root with this shamanic uh, rituals which is very common in our uh, culture doesn't matter if you are Kurdish Armenian Laz uh, or um, Jewish this um, traditions it actually glue the culture to each other so um, this is um, not a wrong question but it is a bit um, um, less knowledge question because like yourself my generation we told also that Arabic alphabet was our alphabet so of course we adapted and our culture is also written by Arabic alphabet but during now I take this old Ottoman language courses uh, from the Turkish History um, Association so I understand that is mixture of Arabic, Persian, Turkish and some French so a young Turk in those days, an Ottoman we used to call because there were many 16 different uh, ethnic groups during Ottoman Empire it took 16 years to read a newspaper my mother herself is a teacher and she tells me that six years old boy or girl now with this Latin alphabet which is quite similar to the uh, uh, Uyghuric or Göktürk alphabet the sounds in Arabic actually the phonetic is not fitting uh, with Turkish sounds with the alphabet it takes only six months six months to read a paper with the Latin alphabet this is Atatürk's one of the greatest revolutions then because during the la la last part of when the Ottoman Empire was falling down the um, literacy rate was only 7% can you believe that and the 90% of this 7% were non-Muslims and the women were not counted as a, as a human being during Ottoman Empire and after the revolution of Atatürk uh, when we became Turkish Republic the the literacy rate is now 89 percent so it's not the miracle it's just the logic I believe other thing is that they are asking me if we are European or uh, Asian yes we are both we are Balkanian Caucasian we are Mediterranean we are Asian we are, we are Indian here I feel because it's mixture of everything and it's very unique in that sense and I'm here I don't feel it's exotic to me I have some friends who studied in the American and the British schools in Turkey it's very bright writers when they come to India they say oh it's so e exotic this is nonsense it's not exotic for us because we are in that sense Asian I give you the last clue to you, this, this I like very much, during the fall of Ottoman Empire, uh, Ottoman Empire was called the sick men of where? Europe. Europe, and they were calling that, so we are European too, but we are Asian, and I think this is very unique quality, and uh, all my, almost all my novels are based on this identity, and I love it, thank you. Do we have any more questions? Uh, Gitanjali, which uh, the story of romance between two uh, women, which era is this story set in? Uh, this story of two, uh, romance between two women, which era is this story set in? And uh, you, when asked about why didn't you speak about the romance between two women openly? Can you hear me now? Yeah, is it better. fine? Yeah. Uh, my question is that which era is this story set in? The story about uh, romance between two women. What's the era and what's the location? Like, if you can talk about that. Also, when you were asked about uh, why didn't you talk about romance openly, you said that you were not aware about the romance. Uh, my question is that do you think subtlety works more, uh, m works better than uh, being too open about it? I mean, as far as the readers are concerned? Um, about the era and the location, um, in, since uh, I, I mean, I'm not interested in uh, absolutely pinpointing it that it's happening in Kanpur or that it's happening in Kanpur or that it's happening in this time. In general, I would say it's, uh, it's the it's a more provincial atmosphere 
and it's small towns of Uttar Pradesh, which is what I know. So it's from there, it's roofs of that kind. It can even be Purani Dilli or Uski Chate. So it's just that kind of atmosphere and it's a kind of women's friendships which uh, are not a feminist statement, you know. I mean, in my mother's time, for instance, uh, there would be friendships, but they were not like, you know, we are, uh, we are, um, it was not a statement, you know, it was just a very, and, and it was an amazingly intimate friendship, uh, which uh, a lot of, I mean, uh, modern women like me found quite amazing because in a very, very simple way, they are very almost uh, unconscious about what it meant. They would dress, uh, they would change their clothes in front of each other. They, they, complete, they would uh, sleep together, you know, one of them would throw her leg over the other one, you know, things which in my generation, it either had to be a statement, it would come much more self-consciously. To, to do that, we had, we had already we had a different kind of consciousness about our bodies and intimacies between girls and so on. So I was I just got very inspired by that kind of friendship, but that kind of friendship didn't have a separate name. It was not in the uh, modern feminist discourse kind of समझ में उसको मैंने डाल सकती थी. So वो कहानी मुझे interest कर रही थी. जहाँ तक रोमांस की आप बात कर रहे हैं वो मैं आ, मैं ये नहीं कह रही हूँ कि मुझे कोई परेशानी है रोमांस के बारे में खुलकर बात करने की मुझे उसकी ज़रूरत नहीं लगी वॉट इंटरेस्टेड मी वॉट इंस्पायर्ड मी वो क्वाइट डिफरेंट थिंग्स एंड समबरी यू नो लाइक समबरी सेट टू मी और यू रिटन अबाउट अ लेस्बियन रिलेशनशिप बिटवीन द टू आई सर आई डोंट नो यू नो आई डोंट रियली नो दे इज अ सीन इन विच इन द नाइट यू नो इट्स वेरी हॉट इन देव थ्रोन some of their clothes off and they are uh, sleeping on the terrace and uh, the nephew and uh, there's, there's some things that happen and the nephew comes there and he remembers you know just seeing a lot of um, he's seeing you know sort of bare breasts in the night now for him it was there was a slight sort of shock element in seeing that but whether it is because the girls are differently intimate और वेदर इट इज़ बिकॉज दे जस्ट दैट वो एक सहज इंटमेसी है जिसकी मैं बात कर रही हूँ इज नॉट ऑफ अ मेजर कंसर्न टू मी फॉर मी इट्स नॉट समथिंग दैट आई नीड टू डी कोड एंड फाइंड आउट रीडर टू डी कोड आई मीन इफ इट लुक्स टू यू लाइक अ लेस बिन रिलेशनशिप एंड फाइन आई मीन इट मे बी इट मे नॉट बी आई डोंट नो हाई first of all when you read that passage in hindi it uh, reminded me of ismat chuktai thank you <laughs> <laughs> and i my question is that i just there have been many writers from 50s to uh, cur uh, in current scene many writers about uh, these issues but when it comes to changes in society we have phenomenal writing phenomenal sessions phenomenal festivals hap happening thinking sessions and all that but when it comes to society the changes are not that phenomenal when it comes to when pragmatic what writers are writing about why is that so <laughs> right from ismat to you to many more i wish we had answers <laughs> well i am um I mean, I don't. I don't think. Um, first of all, I don't think I have to really answer for that. But uh, there is always a lag between, you know, things happen on many planes. The fact that certain things are being thought about and certain things are being written and certain other ways of being and uh, seeing are developing already means that a change is taking place. at some other practical plane maybe that change cannot be seen but it's not true that a change is not taking place the very fact that you know i can think of certain things already means that a change is taking place I like and i'm not the only sense. one thinking it's it possible. clearly you know i'm not unique i think we share a certain sensibility so i think a change is taking place i think buket yeah. needs to wants to add a bit to this so okay yes. Well, it's uh, my first time, so I want to say one more thing before I leave. Um, 
it's the, the world now we are in more or less similar it's like a globalization made the many uh, countries and cultures very similar all the brand names the same brand names of the you know tr uh, um, the, the um, uh, European and American brands are everywhere and we are losing our identities and we have many problems about nature and all those disasters are coming and like this young woman is asking what shall we do we have we know the solutions but it takes so slowly and slowly I think um, this like the ancient beliefs like uh, your wonderful beliefs in Hinduism and this shamanism the earth mother earth is the question uh, the reason the answer of our questions I don't mean that you know we take the feminine body only the mother holy mother no we are women and we have this feminine power and for my um, readers in Turkey I always repeat that feminism is not only for women's right it's the human rights of women and we all have mothers and lovers and wives you know I'm talking to the male audience now and I believe that this male dominating world is not functioning we all agree with that why we are here now we want to hear some solutions through literature it's and the, the male power because we see it sucks everywhere there's so many <laughs> there's so many power problems going on and and many other levels so I believe that the the, the, the key word is female. Even if I were a man, many of my characters in my novels are men and some readers, my male readers, they come and ask me how I know these men's inside. And this is, uh, you don't have to be male writer or woman writer, this is the sense of a real writer. So I believe the key word is in the feminine power and thank you for coming. <laughs>